<laughs> All right, well, you should be recording here in just a step. There we go, recording's working. So in between uh, Seth and I uh, chatting it up, um, so I put that I would be having an interview with you today with Seth, literally like 10 minutes and okay, we got a couple questions already. So sure. uh, do you mind if I just go ahead and hit it? I'd would be happy. Go for it, <laughs> hit it. Okay. So um, of course I'm Cuppy John Rowe. It's very nice to meet you and you're Sasha you. Derry, is that he said? Sasha Derry, CEO of Blue Shift Aerospace. Yep. Perfect. So our first question comes from Paul Watson. He's a friend of mine right down the road, uh, was on the base a long time. How much of the base would you need for a permanent setup if you were to set up at Loring? Uh, first of all, Loring's awesome. <laughs> a lot of uh, I think my, my eyes got big when the very first time I arrived there. And then, uh, you know, folks like uh, Carl and Neil uh, up there have done a great job of showing us around the base. <clears throat> there is so much potential there. So we 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 were immediately um, provided uh, a space where we could uh, set up our operations, which was perfect for what we need to do, and have office space, <clears throat> and have something that we really value: heating. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> immediately, I'd say it's warmer than what we have here in Brunswick. Um, but you know, having that runway was perfect for what we need to launch. Having one of the biggest surprises was the ability for us to access one of the hangars uh, because we wanted to, for safety and security, we wanted to bring in that full hangar, the entire, I'm sorry, the full uh, launch rail system, the launch trailer, fully assembled. We wanted to bring it in at night and park it somewhere and not have to reassemble it. We could park it into the, the what, the hotshot F 15 hangar there. Oh, so you were way at the end. Yeah, it was, uh, it was perfect. Um, you know, you, you you get sad when you walk through the office space there to get into the hangar because you're like, dang on it. I uh, can't believe this is rusting. This is not fair. Um, but the hangar was completely functional uh, and it really made our lives a whole lot easier. Oh, that's good to know. So how do you kind of get to his question more directly? What, what else would we need? Well, we would need a big place to uh, test our engines out because our very next step here is if we get all of our investment funding, is to scale to our full size engine, which would be a bit more powerful. Uh, the burn would last quite a bit longer. Um, we actually had to limit our burn because of FA rules. Uh, we're not allowed to burn more than 15 seconds and stay within a certain license category. Um, so um, we would need an engine test site um, and uh, probably larger office in um, uh, office space and larger work, workshop space in the garage there, of which there seems to be plenty of there at Loring. Oh, yeah. Lots of room. Yeah. So are you looking at um, coming back to Loring for future launches? Not at this time. Uh, we Unless we launch, unless we relaunch this rocket, Stardust 1.0, uh, we have yet to kind of dissect the, the rocket and check out all systems. But what, from what it looks like, everything came back in excellent shape. There was minor <laughs> scraping to the paint job. <laughs> that was it. And that might have happened when we dragged it off. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And if you look at the bottom of the rocket, we have these special tines, these metal tines. It looks like it's doing something fancy. And it kind of is. It's just a, a crumple zone. So when our rocket, that rocket engine comes down, it doesn't bang the engine and damage it. And it worked exactly as we planned. It just crumples up. And all you do is pull those, you know, unbolt those tines and pull them down, put in a new set. And in theory, we can reuse everything except for, you know, to put a new fuel core in there. And that's it. And put in more oxidizer. And we should be, in theory, we should be ready to go. We always do servicing before we do another engine run. Right. But so unless uh, unless customers say they're clamoring to go up a mile, um, we won't be able to launch from there again vertically. Um, and that fundamentally comes down to dispersion. So when you, when you launch a rocket... The FAA wants to know where you might possibly land. And we had to do like over a thousand simulations of possible landing things. The refuge is right to one, you know, to the east side. Yes. And they really did not want our rocket to land there. No. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we started getting to people's homes. Uh, and then we even started getting to the point where we could land on buildings that are actively used uh, at Loring. So we, we didn't want to go to that point. Um, in theory, you could, as long as you prove that you statistically have a one out of a million chance of actually hitting anything. 
Um, but we didn't want to take that risk right now. Doesn't mean that other companies won't will be won't want to take that risk. But I think the real opportunity for Loring is in uh, what companies like Virgin Orbit are doing and what uh, Vault Enterprises, which is based out of Maine, is also doing. They're doing horizontal uh, launch vehicles, meaning the first stage of the rocket is an airplane. Oh, wow. Yeah. So in other words, they strap a smaller rocket than we, than we might underneath the wing of a plane. The plane goes up as high as it can. The rocket's dropped, takes off, and launches. Uh, That's and terrible. Yeah, and that way they can save a lot of weight and fuel. Um, it can also be used for defense purposes. Uh, you know, if you need to go hypersonic really fast, or if you need to really quickly um, put a um, put a satellite back into position that might have gotten knocked out by a, by a, a foe. Well, now is the FAA involved as as far as the regulations from uh, launching from an aircraft versus the ground? Obviously, there's probably less to worry about launching it off of an aircraft. I, I think there's there's some certain certainly some advantages to it for sure. Um, yeah, because a plane can just kind of go off and kind of be, you know, well above the forest by then uh, when they launch. Right. And so I think inherently, yeah, there's some, there's they, they get some safety benefits because they can quickly fly over. Like, for instance, we, for us to go out into the middle of the forest would be a giant logistical ha uh, headache. But for you to fly over the forest and then launch, that's easy. That's pretty cool. Yeah. How, how much was uh, one of the questions is how much was. MSSM involved in uh, the day or the prep, if any? Uh, they've been really supportive of what we were, we were doing. And in fact, uh, we were going to be, the students were going to help out um, and help us uh, manage traffic. Uh, but because of COVID, uh, they, they had to kind of be pulled back. Um, uh, professor there, Larry Birds, Larry, I'm, I'm saying his name wrong. Um, but a Professor Larry there is a science professor who's really been supportive of what we're doing. And, um, you know, our uh, Seth, the, man, the gentleman who was doing the live streaming event, he went right. to school there. Yeah, that's what actually uh, Tim McCabe had told me from the Bunker Inn. Yeah. Um, Tim was kind of leading me about. I wasn't invited into the media area. And then, like I had told Seth, uh, you know, I, I said, listen, I'm with the museum. And boom, Mike let me right through. Excellent. And uh, they're really great part was I, at the time we had over 300 people following us on multiple channels with, you know, with Facebook. So that was, that was pretty cool, but it also increased your audience because people were able to jump right on our site and I was interviewing other people on the ground and That's um, cool. I was really hoping to have met you, but I knew you were crazy busy. So I got to say I hi did. for a moment. <laughs> I know. Well, true, true. Um, so what was the toughest challenge that you had to face and overcome on the day of the launch? Oh, temperature. Yeah. <laughs> temperature by far. Whew. I mean, we'd, um, yeah, that the temperature really beat us up. I mean, I think all of us uh, may have gotten a little more frostbite than we intended in the last, in the, over the course of about 48 hours. Um, but if you just remove the human element, the biggest challenge was to our batteries. Uh, you know, we had batteries that went down. They could, they'll perform to minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Right. And uh, I thought, oh, we'll be fine with that. It won't get to below minus 10. <laughs> Turns out it was minus 14 the, mo the morning we started. Yeah, when I left my house, it was minus 13. So, yeah. And the flight line tends to be a little colder. So, you're actually lucky because um, there's been guys here on this on our sites who minus 45. They've seen oh. minus 45. The yeah. coldest I've seen it is minus 49 here in Maine. So, we had a warm day. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta tell you, the very next day when it was uh, like in the you know, the teens, it was, it was gorgeous. <laughs> oh yeah, downright tropical. <laughs> <laughs> well, by afternoon it actually was very nice when it went off at three, and, and it was like the yeah. gods had cleared. It was beautiful. It was amazing. The, the blue skies. It opened up. Yeah, totally it was. Really nice. But we, you know, it wasn't even. You know, the day before when it wasn't even minus fourteen, it was a minus. Um, no, it was just down to the single digits. Um, my the networking equipment stopped working. Oh, did it? Yeah. So we, <laughs> the main router, which uh, is housed in the launch trailer, refused to function anymore. It just shut off. And I sometimes I wonder if that kind of is what part of what happened to our live feed, but I don't really know. We're still trying to figure that out. 
Oh, okay. But I think it actually had to do with the vibration of the rocket uh, taking off. And there's an antenna dish. If you look on the trailer, there's this white yeah. antenna dish. And I think the, the vibration of the launch caused it to vibrate and it's losing sync with the opposing antenna dish on the other, where we were at Mission Control, which is where what Seth was getting his feed from. So you ultimately see Seth changes his, um, his video feed channel to the onboard analog cameras, which are like drone cameras, where you just get an analog, almost like a TV view, and it's scratchy, but you can see the earth kind of, you know, below. Uh, and uh, um, so, yeah, anyways, back to it, temperature. Temperature. But, but I gotta say, uh, I, th I think it speaks loads to what our team was capable of doing. You know, I think that's what growing up in Maine is about, and people who live in Maine inherently, you're rugged, and if you're from the county, you're more rugged yet, and uh, you you know you persevere. Yeah, it's oh, cold. It's not fun. You. you do it. <laughs> you don't really have a choice. <laughs> and I think I think I think folks from other states uh, might um, might call it a day and say, yeah, we'll try this some other week, maybe in uh, April. We'll see. One <laughs> <laughs> uh, of the gentlemen walked by to congratulate us on the on the launch. So. Uh, Perfect. I'm here at Tech Place down in Brunswick. At, at oh, nice. Yeah. So, um, can you give us a little black uh, background of uh, of the company itself, Blue State, and also why biofuel? Sure, Blue Shift. So, um, Blue Shift. I wrote company, it down. Wrong. Oh, sure. I did write it down wrong. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Right. Um, so, uh, Blue Shift was founded in 2014. It, I actually started it when I was living in Massachusetts. Um, and I have a solar company down there. And I started up with a group of like-minded individuals, um, mostly engineering and science folks. And um, I didn't tell them what my plans were in terms of ultimately building a rocket and launching it and sending CubeSats and other experiments to space. Um, I did tell them that my ultimate dream was for us to be the first company to send a small probe in the general direction of our closest uh, stellar neighbor, Alpha Centauri Proxima. And that is, that, is our, that is our big, big, big mission. There's not much money in sending stuff there, but if we, we get enough money along the path of the next decade, I hope that we are the first company to send something to Alpha Centauri Proxima, even if it's just a small stamp size probe, the ultimate space shot. So um, it started there and we, we got to a point where we developed our technology. I, I discovered this biofuel while doing ro small little rocket engine tests with hybrid rocket engines at my brother's farm in North Yarmouth. Uh, he's a farmer down there and uh, he let me use his field for a bit. Farms are great for rocket experiments. Lots of room. Yeah, lots of room. And uh, I, I happened to sit down in my brother's kitchen I looked on the windowsill and he just pulled something off uh, of his farm uh, just a few days prior. And I saw it, I thought, I wonder if that solid substance would serve as a good rocket fuel compared to the solid substance we were using, which was petroleum derived. So I, we, uh, my buddy and I, he was an, he's a fellow graduate from the University of Southern Maine. We spun up a, a new fuel grain or a new fuel core as we call it. And uh, about two weeks later, we tested the engine immediately and immediately it was it, you, you could see it. It, it performed the, the, the data immediately showed that it performed much better than the petroleum version. So it was like, oh, hey, it's bio drive. You can get it right from the farm. It doesn't require petroleum. That's a win. That's a win. Um, and being somebody who's, uh, you know, I, I started a solar company, I'm, you know, inherently, my, you know, my favorite planet happens to be the one we're standing on. Uh, it's Earth. Fantastic air, food's not that bad. You know, the, life, the folks living around here aren't too bad. The aliens don't bite. Uh, so, it's it it for us. It's important that um, uh, to take care of our planet and to be responsible with it. And I part agree. of that, yeah, part of that is choosing to use uh, fuels that are more responsible. So ultimately, it turns out that our fuel is more energy dense than traditional liquid rocket fuel, which is called RP-1, which is basically, it's like jet fuel, you know, it's this really refined jet fuel. And it, it costs half, half of what, per, per calorie, per kilogram, it costs about half of what traditional rocket fuel. And you can easily get it from farms across America, across the world. Uh, so um, we're delighted. Huh? How can you beat that? I know, exactly. It's like, all like, Better for the world, 
better economically. It's a whole lot safer. It's completely non-toxic. Um, you could ingest it and it wouldn't hurt you. Um, and unlike other, we don't need special permits. to. We could carry 12 kilotons of this stuff down the road and we wouldn't need a special permit other than, you know, the weight class of the vehicle that would need to <laughs> carry it. So you can't do that with normal rocket fuel. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you can't. No, definitely not. So how did the onboard projects, because I, I was reading, uh, I think there were two of them. There were there they, three. With the three. How did yeah. they make out? How'd they make out? Yes. Uh, we are still waiting to hear back from um, the sort of two more scientific ones because they have yet to analyze their data. We can see the LEDs were still on, uh, which is a good sign. So we're, we're waiting to hear if they got the data they wanted. Uh, one was the uh, from the Falmouth High School students, and uh, they had used um, these sort of Lego building block electronics things. That are, it's called X in a Box. They're specifically for students so they can make easy projects and they don't have to bother learning how to solder stuff together or put components together. But they snap pieces together. They want this sensor and they want to have this sort of like data reader. They want to have a GPS thing and they click it all together. And then they program it to do whatever ex experiment they wanted to do. In this case, they did like barometric readings. They did uh, GPS readings. They did altitude, um, temperature, and they recorded it to a little uh, data card. Um, the other one was from a company called Kellogg Research Lab. They're based out of Nashua, New Hampshire. I was sitting next to that guy all day. <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah. Joe. Joe, he's great. Um, so they they use, uh, they have a nitinol, sort of a vertically integrated nitinol company. Nitinol is like this memory shape alloy. Um, it's It has, I, I always tell people it's like vibranium, if you're familiar with like Captain America and his shield. Um, it takes uh, vibration and converts it to heat, so you can it can really resist vibration. They ultimately want to use it in things like spacecraft. We might use it in our um, our payload section to dampen vibration as the payloads go up. Uh, but so he wanted to de demonstrate how it works in a uh, relevant rocket environment because they're planning to to um, sell into the aerospace industry heavily. So this this was an important demonstration. So they had sensors on it demonstrating. Here's what it is with nitinol, with the vibration. Here's what it is if you didn't have nitinol and the vibration. So looking forward very much to seeing what that data looks like. That would be really neat. Yeah, and the other one I would say is um, experimental in um, creativity. <laughs> <laughs> Accompanied by the, the, the name of Rocket Insight, uh, really good folks. Um, it's, an, it's a software company. I think because of their namesake, they wanted to launch with us uh, they, they sponsor a launch with us and they're owned by a, a European company and there's um, apparently the, they, 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 there's a bet between they, there was a bet between them uh, and the European uh, the, their company and the one in Europe and they won the bet and the, the winner gets a year's worth of what's called Stroop waffle. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. It's like a never have. very thin waffle and a caramel center and then another little waffle. They're delicious. I, I think I've had them once before, and it was really hard not to eat them when they gave them to us. They launched Group Waffle in the payload bay, so we gave them the we gave them the container, and uh, they said, "Okay, yeah, we like to put Group Waffle." They're like, "Okay, but you're gonna need to put that into a container because I don't want Group Waffle all inside my payload area." True story. <laughs> yeah, and, and they also gave us tourmaline inside of a container uh, because they wanted to have the ultimate rocket rock tumbler. So it was sort of an inspirational thing uh, for the, all their software programmers to have, a, I think, a laugh. Um, and they get a real joy, uh, especially during these tough COVID times uh, where so many people have to stay home. That's pretty neat. Nice That's project. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I look forward to seeing how the projects, you know, once they get all their data, we'll have to continue to follow. Um, so I, I know your time is limited, so I'm going to ask you one final question, but uh, why Stardust? What? Why the name? Sure. It's not because of David Bowie. We get that question. Uh, <laughs> I know that's where you're going. Uh, it, it's actually, if you start the other direction, you start from our what was currently our, our largest um, our largest rocket that we planned for called Red Dwarf, which okay. is also not named after a TV series. Just want to make sure that's clarified. Uh, if, you, if you recall, I referred to where we want to eventually launch to, which is Alpha Centauri Proxima, which is a red star, commonly known as a red dwarf. 
Okay. So the, 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 our ultimate rocket, which will take uh, small satellites into a polar orbit, low Earth orbit um, in a polar uh, trajectory, uh, is named Red Dwarf for that sake. The next step down um, is called uh, um, uh, a brown uh, a brown dwarf, but that sounded just sounded a little sketchy. We didn't want to, we didn't want to call our, our rocket brown dwarf, so we we decided that there's another synonym for brown dwarf stars, and that's starless rogue. Um, these are often like very dim stars that barely are giving any sort of um, you know, electromagnetic spectrum off. They're very dark and they seem sometimes seen as like, well, they're just kind of shooting through uh, a galaxy and they seem to be just sort of naked from, um, you know, in terms of um, any other planets. So they're, so they're often called starless rogues. So that's where we came up with starless rogue. So then we decided, well, we have to get smaller yet. And what, what is our prototype vehicle is going to be? You can't get much smaller than a brown dwarf star or a starless rogue star. So we're like, oh man, what is what is what is sort of like a fundamental building block of, um, you know, of the universe? You know, it's from supernovas, and what are we all made of? We're all made up of stardust. Stardust. We're gonna we're gonna start with a fundamental building block of of the universe, stardust, and that's uh, that's sort of our fundamental building block for our rocket program. I love the name. I thought Thank it was you. very cool. But Thank just sort of on the on the, the radio, I was like, wow, that's I really like that. Did you know on the way up in Holton, on the way up on, uh, is it Route 1? I think it's Route 1. Uh, oh, there is a motel named Stardust. Yes, there is. I took a picture of it on my way home to last night. <laughs> Did you get the planets as you come up? Uh, I caught a couple of them. I, I think I saw Uranus. Um, uh, shoot, I saw another one too. I didn't I didn't catch them all. I have to, I have to keep coming back up so I can see them all. Yeah, there's... Uh, well, I, actually, the other day I noticed one was missing. Turns out it was Saturn, uh, which is actually one of the better ones. But then is Jupiter. And, but anyway, it's really cool because it starts at um, uh, University of Maine Prescott with the oh, sun really? the building, and then it ends down in Holton at the rest stop with Pluto, like on his. It looks like a marble on top of the stick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's pretty cool at the rest area. Well, then I can explain why I miss Pluto. That that you'd have to stop. To be honest, I haven't seen Pluto because <laughs> I've that rest stop. Yeah. I always see Dunkin' Donuts. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> just saying. <laughs> exactly. So um, I know the guys and, and the ladies that were uh, stationed here were really excited over the fact that Loring became this place that um, you know was once used during the Cold War and the Vietnam War and all the different conflicts, and it became this place where history was made. Once again, yeah. by by a rocket that blasted off from, you know, our flight line. And we call it our flight line because mm. we served at that base. Uh, and to many of us, it, it, it was tragic at close, but it's nice to see that some things have made their way back or are just beginning, hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully for you guys, just beginning. I hope, I, I hope, I hope that we got the word out that this is an incredible resource that Maine has. Um, I was sort of awestruck with what all is there uh, and the potential that lies there. I was also surprised to hear there's already a lot of aerospace companies working there. I, I, my understanding is SpaceX's Starlink satellite, uh, satellite uh, downlink, one of their stations is there. Uh, there's a number, you know, and there was a former blimp company. Yes. But <clears throat> um, there is so much potential there uh, that could be had. And I think in the aerospace world, we need, you need spaces where people, where people can operate sort of, um, sort of uh, cowboyish. I, I, cowboyish is the wrong word, but you can have a lot of independence doing things that's a little bit dangerous and the neighbors won't get pissed. I no. think that, that is Loring. <laughs> uh, we, were, we were surprised that we could get it here in Brunswick because the, I, I forgot to tell you, part of the reason we moved from Massachusetts is we couldn't find anywhere that would allow us to test our engines at all. And uh, and then we were told to go elsewhere looking for funding. Uh, Massachusetts does bio, you know, bio, biopharma and, and biotech. But fortunately, one of the actually a person in the state of Massachusetts said, you know, check out Maine. They might have some funding for you. And I was like, I want, I've been trying to go back to Maine for 20 years. I'd love to go back to Maine. And that's where we found out about Maine Technology Institute. So. They're actually well, the ones that, that kind of said, here, okay, move your company to Maine. Yeah. 
And we'll come like, I've been trying to find the excuse. Here we go. Let's go. Oh, there you go. I'm telling you, I, I think it's incredible. Um, the whole project itself. I mean, I was, when I first heard about it, I was unfortunately working the first time. So I was grateful it didn't go up. I can do it again. Yes. Nice. I was kind of like the first two times it didn't go. I'm like, oh, please go off. Please go off. And when <laughs> it happens, uh, we have so many followers. So, it, it, uh, I, I have been, we, I, our whole team is, have been, uh, we've been blown away with reception and, and people have been so kind to us and so generous, uh, um, especially there in Limestone. But, you know, even online, we, we were getting people saying they were so um, congratulatory and encouraging when things were failing. And it was insane the number of people that were staying with us. The, 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 the live streaming of event for went for like six or seven hours. And um, people stuck with us. And that wasn't all our family members, I just want to say. I don't have that many family members. So. <laughs> oh, no, it wasn't family members. We had people like, when I didn't know, I did not know about the live stream originally. I didn't know that I could listen and hear what was going on. So I was behind and all these people are coming up with information like there's a problem with the oxygen and there's a delay and it's going to go off at this time. How are they getting this information? And then finally I was hearing it on someone's radio and I'm like, there's a channel. Yeah. And then someone gave it to me, but yeah. I was lucky enough that, so I can tell you now, they weren't people of yours. They were people of ours that were chiming in saying, we're watching it from Connecticut and Tennessee and that Texas, is so cool. Colorado. And I thought that's very cool. I, I, I think there's something about, you know, watching a small team of people do something really innovative and especially in a state like Maine. I think we're bucking the tradition that this can only be done in like Texas, Florida, and California. And we yeah. plan to continue to buck this tradition. So stay tuned. Good. I'm glad to hear because from guys and girls who served at a base that meant so much to them. That's really cool. You're doing the right, you're in the, you're headed in the right direction for us. We appreciate it. Uh, well, thank you guys very much. So uh, we, I want to thank you for your time. I know your time is very precious and uh, appreciate Seth calling me and, and talking to you. Um, and I guess you got, you can let me know how I'm going to get the video, but I really appreciate sure. it. I'll, uh, yeah, it takes a few minutes to, I'll stop recording here, but um, probably will take